I, I won't introduce I won't introduce Simon because I know he's he's a down to earth guy and he doesn't he, he's not big on ceremony. But he, everyone I'm sure knows who he is. For anyone who hasn't heard him speak before, he is from Birmingham. You'll you'll hear that. Well, 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 where? You, sorry, you always tell me off for saying that. Where are you from? Wolverhampton. Wolverhampton. I was born in Wolverhampton, which is the black country. Yeah. Birmingham is not the black country. I'm not from Birmingham. <laughs> he always gets up there in say my that. life. It, it, it all sounds since the, the, all the accents sound the same to me. Um, it's a beautiful accent. Everything sounds more intelligent from there, and that's why we've got him on to talk about this subject. Not least because he knows more about this subject than anyone I've ever spoken to. And what we want to get get on to talk about is how we write our prescriptions, our orthosis prescriptions, and this possible concept of, of, of dosing and what that might mean and, and the applicability of that. But before we get to that, we thought it might be sensible. For, for just in case there's anyone watching who doesn't know the, the backstory to this, the context, um, to talk a bit about orthosis research in general. Um, can we kick off by, by you giving us your, your take, Simon, on orthosis research, where, where it's currently at? And what I mean by that is the methodology and the, and the limitations and how we need to be wary of the conclusions made because of the context of the limitations of methodology. Yeah, I mean, in simple terms, in my view, foot orthosis research in many respects has run before it can walk. So what we've done is we've rushed to the perceived gold standard of the placebo controlled randomized trial before we really understand how foot orthosis exert their therapeutic effects. So we end up with a situation where uh, researchers are using so-called placebo devices or sham devices which aren't inert in terms of their potential to influence the pathology under study. So what I mean by that is we, we can have what the authors consider to be a placebo device or a sham device which is actually impacting upon uh, the kinetics of the foot and lower extremity uh, and without a, a demonstration of that impact we can't be certain whether the, the the sham device is actually exerting a therapeutic effect does that make sense mm. yeah absolutely so what we're saying here is when we compare orthosis x with placebo slash sham we don't know that the placebo yeah. slash sham is indeed it would, are we, are we, we're probably comparing orthosis X with orthosis yeah, because, Y. Because we need to see that the device is, is, is not exerting a, uh, an impact on the target tissue. Um, if, if we follow a tissue stress approach, then uh, patients present really tendency for, for want of a, a, a better pathology. Uh, and we might want to conduct a trial to see if orthoses are better than a sham in terms of treating Achilles tendinopathy. The first thing that we need to do is show that our potential predictor, what, what we need to all perform a study, which, uh, and this is what's missing. We, we seem to be jumping to the, the end of the research route before we've completed the research that needs to be done at the start of the research route. So if I was to say to you, let, let's get some Socratic learning because I know you're a big fan of it. If I was to say to you, okay, list all the elements of the Achilles tendinopathy, you would say, have we lost him? Is he there? Yeah. Simon, what might be the I didn't, I, Achilles tendinopathy? I didn't hear loads of that. I don't know if it was just my end because I'm in Yeah, no, I think there's just, I think your connection's coming through a bit dodgy. Um, you, but but you, surely, surely one solution to this problem of you know sham placebo is just to drop the term sham placebo let's just call yeah. it orthoses a call it with just, design features yeah. orthoses b yeah. with these design features but orthoses b design features are very flimsy you know, that that yeah. to me solves the problem but then we need to know 
the mechanical effects of orthoses A, the mechanical effects of orthoses B, um, and that let's just drop the term placebo sham. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. No, but you, you've got to go to the trouble of, 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 are you getting me? Yeah. You've got to go to the trouble of actually showing what those kinetic stroke kinematic effects of both devices are. You can't just jump to the control trial and say, here's a device. You need to actually do the research and show what that device does. Now you and, you and I know, and, uh, and Ian knows, that those, those effects are going to be subject dependent and they're, and they're lie off the problem so rather rather than saying okay what's wrong with the research you know a, a better question might be how would you design the research hmm. i like so, i like thinking um, sorry I, I like thinking about it as if to say how the, the people watching what take homes could we give them when they read research the next time they pick up an orthosis published a paper published paper on foot orthoses what things should they be thinking and she clearly take home one here is look at what was referred to as a sham or placebo and make a decision also, about whether you feel that's look, appropriate. look at what was referred to as as the uh, the intervention device right so coming on to that point our, our custom made Craig devices has said it many many times before you know if if you're if you doing a study that are being employed in that study uh, do they have the design features that you or I would put into a device for somebody with plantar fasciitis yeah. oh, I think that, but that, that's classic I mean I, I think if you're going to do a study of a thesis whether it's custom-made pre-made or whatever you would want design features that are designed to reduce the load in the plantar fascia you don't okay. want this you want design features that were used for patellofemoral pain or, or something else but you when you look across the studies they, they are the same but it reminds me of a very fascinating discussion the other weekend with uh, Richard Jones from um, Salford. And he's done quite a few studies on lateral wedging for neo -A. Now, at the moment, the systematic reviews are showing that it probably doesn't work too well. But his most recent study is that they are randomizing people to the control or the lateral wedging. But then the lateral wedging people go into the lab and have their kinetics and kinematics measured. If the lateral wedge has not changed the abductor moment, they are excluded. So they're actually only including people where the lateral wedging has been shown to reduce yeah. the abduction moment. And well, that's perfect. Now, not but not one foot orthotic study has done that. We haven't actually, you know, plantar fasciitis. We haven't <laughs> no, used orthotics. Yeah. No. And the first thing that you would want to do, I I I guess, right? If if I was doing a study of plantar fasciitis, I would measure the hallux dorsiflexion stiffness. And I would measure the change in the hallux dorsiflexion stiffness with the device. Oh, yeah. You know, that, I mean, it's not, we, we don't need technology to do that. We can do that with a, you know, a digital luggage scale, basically. Um, and let's say what we want is in, in, our, in our treatment group, we want the hallux dorsiflexion stiffness reduced by 50%. So the devices might be different for every individual within the study group, <laughs> but their dorsiflexion stiffness is all reduced by the same amount. <coughs> and then presumably in the control group, what we would want is that dorsiflexion stiffness to remain unchanged. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And we're really getting into the concept of dosing here, aren't we? We're, yeah. we're saying everyone in the group gets a prescription that, that gives them the same dose of the drug, you know, reduction of kinetic measure. The fact that they're all wildly different is irrelevant. And what we're currently no. doing in our research is in the experimental group, everyone's getting the same device. The same. Which, which the we, same we... unknown amount. And that's yeah. the key. Isn't it? We're, yeah. we're giving them this, this, this insult. Oops, we just lost you for a we, moment, Simon. We have no idea of the impact that that's having on the variable of interest. Mm. So, is what are the variables of interest? And apparently, my internet connection is unstable. Yeah, yeah I agree. I agree. <laughs> yeah, we just just I just give it give it a moment to reset, Simon. But the variable of interest in plantar fasciitis is have you has does the does, do the design features reduce the load in the plantar fascia? The variable of interest in patellofemoral pain will be perhaps is the rear foot inversion moment reduced? Inversion moment reduced? Increased? 
Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's going to be different for a different pathology. Yet when you look across all the different studies yeah. and different pathologies, they all use the same design features, and then we're told they don't work. Well, yeah. <laughs> so we pick up an, we pick up a, pa a paper. We straight away we say the sham probably isn't a sham. The no. custom made the custom made device in the experimental group probably isn't custom made. You know, it doesn't mirror clinical practice. It, uh, so straight away, it, it may well be custom made, but it may may not have the design variables that an experienced clinician would put into that device. Yeah, it, it doesn't sort of mirror what what people are doing in in clinics. No. So straight away, the two. <laughs> The, 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 I mean, the, the, the key is that if, if you've got a group of, of expert clinicians in a room, I'm sure we would come up with a consensus with regard to what design features we might put into a device for somebody with plantar fasciitis, for somebody with Achilles tendinopathy. Th there will be variations between the individual patient, but there will be themes across them. But we've even got to take it back the step before that which is what are the factors which produce <coughs> that so you know if if Achilles tendinopathy let's say is linked with uh, increased ankle joint dorsiflexion stiffness then the the variable of interest to us is that variable and we need to demonstrate that our foot orthosis design is is making a change to that or mm. not so for example let, let's say let's say we know that achilles tendinopathy is linked with uh, an increase in ankle dorsiflexion stiffness we can get a measure of that to a certain extent using a, a lunge test modified lunge test so let's say we we, we do a lunge test and then we put uh, a foot orthosis under the foot and we increase the heel lift on that until we see a 25 or 50 percent increase <laughs> in the angle achieved at the lunge test and we do that across all of the the subjects in the treatment group now that's that's an improvement on where we are today now i'm not saying mm. that's the answer i'm just giving an example of one potential of how we can go with that and that would mean some people would have a three mil heel raise, some people would have a yeah. ten mil heel raise, yeah. and people now people would open that paper, you know, with their current level of thinking hat on, and say, "What the devil have they done in this? They've given everyone different heel raises." Whereas the way it would be designed today would be everyone gets a six mil heel raise, which is a, yeah. again a an unknown and different kinetic dose between people, which yeah. clearly is, is less well, than ideal that, than what you're describing. Because because in that example we were using. Uh, a kinematic measure actually to kinematic dose isn't it you think well it's yes yeah thanks Bob. Yeah. But, I, yeah. Should, but, yeah. Before we progress this discussion, um, I, I, I just did say earlier on that you know, we, if we're doing a study on plantar fasciitis, we want a design feature that reduces the load, inversion moment of patellofemoral pain, the, what Simon said in Achilles. Steve Wells just asked a question, how do you show that though? And I think that's where, unfortunately, at this stage, a whole lot of assumptions have to come into the clinical decision-making process. You know, um, what, you know, what do you mean by show that? Well, okay, so let, let's say if, if the model we use for orthoses, say, in patellofemoral pain is to reduce that rear foot inversion moment. Okay. Well, how do we know we're doing that clinically with our yeah. foot orthoses? Now, I think we have design features that we know that should do that. We make an assumption if we use those design features that's going to happen. But again, it's that we are lacking some quick, quick, nasty, cheap, simple clinical yeah, tests. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's... And, that, uh, and that's, the, that's the real disconnect between yeah. the, the published literature and the, yeah. and the, the man at the coalface because, you know, mm. we, we, we don't generally in clinical practice have a force plate. Mm. We can't measure knee abduction moment, um, which is why I which uses tests and equipment which is available to anybody, which, you know, in, in the example I gave of the, of the plantar fasciitis, we could measure that high dorsiflexion stiffness with oh, yeah. something that costs a couple of quid. You, you know, it, it, it's not quite as simple when you're trying to measure knee, knee moments. But as you say, if we, do the, if we do the groundwork and get that research in place, 
then we can make a reasonable assumption that uh, if if we put a you know a, a six degree varus medial rear foot post in, it will impact on the knee abduction moment in this way, mm -hmm. uh, which we've got to a certain extent. We've already got that kind of kind of information, but it needs more work. Yeah, but I think that's, that's the key. That's I think, I think the, the key point is we, in clinic, we don't know, like you say. So we, we rely on the, the people with the force plates, with the knowledge of inverse dynamics to, to do the, the, the formative work so that we can then lean on it. But we don't have anything to lean on at the moment. Yeah. We don't have enough to lean on, do we? Sure. Yeah. Bruce Williams has just made the comment that pressure mapping can go some way to, to, to giving us that information. But a well, classic example that I often well, use, sorry, sorry, a classic yeah. example I often use is just using Jack's test grab the hallux dorsiflexor on and off the orthoses in people with plantar fasciitis. Now, if Jack's test gets easier with the foot orthoses, you make an assumption, yes, we may have reduced the load, but it'd be really nice to see a study done showing that, yeah, if Jack's test or the dorsal dorsiflexion stiffness I'm goes down, yeah. that predicts those that get... Yeah. Sorry, I think you're lost, dropped out again, again, Simon. Yeah, we'll just... The internet in Plymouth is clearly uh, inferior to the internet here in Norfolk. Yeah, oh. so, so Simon's just, he yeah, he'll, he'll, he's probably just logged back out and logged back in again. Um, so let's, you, so where, where, so where are we at while we're waiting for him to come back? Well, I was, <laughs> I'm just, just scrolling down the questions to see if we... No, here's Simon, he's back now. Hey, Simon, we lost you for a minute. <laughs> Welcome back. Yeah. Yeah. So did you catch that last comment of mine? Or? No. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> pretty much what I said is that going back to what can we do clinically that could help predict it. And I, the classic example that I have often talk about is Jack's test. Yeah. yeah. On and off the orthoses. Now, does the orthoses make that easier? If it has made it easier, we can make an assumption that that's reduced the load in the plantar fascia. Yeah. But it'd be really nice to see, and it would be, wouldn't be that difficult to do, a, a prospective study showing that, yes, if Jack's test is made lower with the athletic design, they do get better. If Jack's test is not made easier with the athletic design, they don't get better. Yeah. But we're really lacking yeah, that I, information. I, I, and I would take it a stage further, and I, and I would just quantify that stiffness. Oh, well, yeah. You know, yeah. You know, uh, uh, and say, okay, well, is, is there a threshold at which point a patient gets better or doesn't, does it need to be reduced by 20%, 50%, 75%? <coughs> is there a threshold? What we'll find is that it'll vary across individuals, obviously. Oh but it, it, this, this, it, it, in a drugs trial, it would be dose titration. So what they would do is they would increase the active ingredient uh, and the strength of the active ingredient until they got a response. It's not quite as easy as that in football <laughs> um, To a certain extent, the, the, the Telfer study uh, or studies, uh, mm -hmm. that, that's exactly what they were trying to do. They, they were titrating the dose mm -hmm. of the rear foot post and looking at its impact on uh, EMG and rear foot eversion moments and all of that. Um, in, in the real world, in clinic, we don't have that uh that luxury but you know certainly if i'm if i'm fitting a device whether it be an off the shelf or a custom device for somebody with with, with plantar fasciitis plantar heel pain i will want to know is that is that how it does flexion stiffness changed with or without the device and if it ain't changed with the device i'm going to make changes to the device until it is reduced Oh yeah, and no. that's just that's just basic clinical practice. Yeah, yeah. but interesting, you mentioned those TOEFL studies. I'm just looking them up so I can put them up as on a screenshot. Let me just show one of them. Um, oh, hang on, sorry, but th th these were studies that, again, as you said, just altered the design features to. Um, they basically used the, the, the same the same orthot orthotic shell. Yeah. Um, and, and changed and the then, heel posting. Uh, changed the heel posting. Yeah. yeah. And, but they measured, in this particular one here, the effect on muscle activity and plantar pressures. And the other one, they looked at the, the kinematics. But it, what, what I find interesting is the date. This is, this is five years old. Um, and it really, I haven't seen many studies reference it. Um, that, you know, when a, a clinical trial is done in foot orthoses, there's no acknowledgement that if we um, change yeah, the angle of the heel posting, we might actually get a different result in this particular study. 
Um, so we're not exactly talking about, well, five years. Well, it's not old, but it's certainly not a recent study. Um, it's a good study. I like them. You know, it's... I like it. Um, there's, there's some things I'd like to see in it that I can't see in it. You know, that, um, uh, that I was talking to Kevin just, just prior to coming on. They, they make a statement about increasing the medial post and it's shifting, or, or they seem to intimate that it should shift the centre of pressure laterally. Well, if I'm putting a, a medial or various rear foot post, I would expect it to shift the centre of pressure medially, not laterally. So mm. there's some things in there that, you know, I'd like to talk to Telfer about and say, did you mean that or was that a typo? But generally speaking, they're good studies. They're strong studies. Oh, yeah. But but even even if they weren't, the whole concept is not referenced in clinical trials. No, no. <laughs> I, I wonder why. Yeah. Um, but again, I... I, I in that blog post, I made the comment there that you know when, when they present their research, maybe they need to say this is how we did the orthoses. Um, could anyone in the audience who does it that way please put your hands up? And you know, I think yeah. they're going to be shocked to find that very few people, if any, will put their hands up because it's not the way it's done clinically. Now, I no, fully acknowledge no. that some of the studies might do something I might not disagree with, but I might disagree with. But I fully acknowledge that a lot of people might do it that way. But the problem is a lot of people don't do it that way. <laughs> no. And I, and I, I think that, that, that we, we talked a little bit previously before coming on air, but, you, you know, the idea of publishing your protocol prior to performing the study is a great one, but you need to act on the responses that you get. And when you, when you get uh, a protocol, let, let's say, for Achilles tendinopathy, where you've got all the clinicians saying, I would, I would normally use a heel raise, uh, prior to the study being performed and then the researchers saying well actually we're not going to bother with a heel raise even yeah. though you know virtually every clinician I know would stick some sort of heel raise on that mm. yeah, no, it's, uh... so you, you kind of lose faith wrongly in the researchers you know the researchers are they're there uh, as as Ian's pointed out they, they've got to put that groundwork in for us clinicians in a lot of situations because we just haven't got the kit to do it but when you've got a group of, of highly skilled clinicians all saying the same thing. At what point do you say, hang on a minute, should we change this protocol? Or, or is it a situation, I, you know, I don't know. Um, there is obviously a lag between writing a manuscript and it being published. Is it a case of that by the time these sort of draft protocols are published, the researchers have already moved on to the data collection and it's... Oh, of, of, course, of course they have. They're, they're on to the study. Too right. Yeah, you know? which, which begs the question, what was the point of publishing the protocol? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, it, it gives you another reference to cite, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, so, I, I, I learned cynicism from Craig, by the way. Yeah, well, I've, been, I've been pretty excited at times in you know, the last few years where you see a, a, a title for a study. I thought, oh, wow, this is going to be great. And you rush off to see the results. And you go, oh, damn, it was just the protocol. <laughs> yeah. So just to summarize, for, for those watching who, who, you know, just to summarize what we've talked about so far, you pick up a paper, the orthosis paper. You need to be looking at the experimental group and what device they were given. And you need to make, you need to make a judgment about whether you think that's appropriate. Uh, it, was it indeed customized, custom made, or you know, um, it doesn't mirror clinic, clinic, does it mirror clinical practice? You need to look at the control group and see what device they were given, and is it a sham? Is it a placebo? What is it? You know, etc. You then need to look at um, the the way the data is reported. You've mentioned at least twice now, Simon. Which I think we need to touch on now is this between subject variation we know that if all three of us were given the same device we would have a different response uh, however whatever how would we want to dis di di uh, explain response or describe response when i read orthosis research and they publish their data they of they often mean pool it so they'll they'll capture data on 32 individuals and then the, they'll they'll give me a, a measure whether it be e-version excursion a kinematic measure for example and they'll present it as a mean with a standard deviation and um it's, it's hugely unhelpful to us because it doesn't really tell us how any individual in that study no. responded and that's the really cli clinically meaningful stuff because every person we see in yeah. clinic isn't any is one case one? Yeah. Yeah. as you as you he's taught like, me you um you good. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's not bad He's good on the advice, I'll give him that. Um, so, I mean, 
is the answer moving forward and you know you've done research craig's done research um is the answer moving forward to, to as a researcher to present subject specific data so you've got 32 people in a subject in, in the study i want to see how every single one of those 32 responded is that feasible and is it the way forward yes yes and yes yeah <laughs> i mean of course okay. a, lot, a lot more work right there's a there's a study that I know all three of us cite when we're lecturing, and that's the the, the, the Ben and Nick study where they used half a dozen devices which were all the same geometrically, but were made of different uh, density materials, different stiffness materials. And Benno in that paper uh, presents the data in in a fairly unique way, which is very very easy to understand and shows the. The, the subject specific response I'm going to go out there and I'm going to say why not make that a standard for the um, the, the graphical representation of um, research data for foot orthoses yeah but I think probably what's lacking in all that is what we as clinicians need is the what simple clinical predictor can we use to predict the response so if you put an orthosis in one person, they go one way, put the same orthosis in someone else to go the other way. Okay, uh, okay. what was it that determined that? And that, that basic science hasn't been done yet. No, no, of course it hasn't. And I mean, let, let, let's rewind the clock and take us all back to the age of five years of age. Um, how do we know that I would still have all of this? All right. Oh, I'll stop it. I know where oh, you're going, oh, Jesus. I think I'll... Hey, Simon, I've got a mute button here. I can stop it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the reality is that we we know there are certain predictors for male pattern baldness because that basic groundwork has been done yeah now e equally you, you know we've got for example i know there was a, there was another study published yesterday the other day before on medial tibial stress syndrome but can't remember the reference off the top of my head but there was a study done which basically uh built a, a, a multiple regression model of medial tibial stress syndrome and it came down to gender and navicular drop mm. yeah, so we, we know that we've got a reasonable handle on predicting that pathology so gender we can't alter very easily as a, as a podiatrist I have to be down with the kids um, <laughs> But we know that we should be able to impact the navicular drop. Now, correlation is not causation, obviously. But one of the factors that we might want to be impacting on uh, with our foot orthosis designs in a patient with medial tibial stress syndrome is navicular drop because it's a known predictor for that pathology. Yeah. Mm. So going back to the Ben O'Nick study that we all know, um, 1998 that was published, the one that you're talking about, 20 years ago, 20 years ago this year, I can't think of another, well if I can, I can, I can count them on one hand in the last 20 years, the amount of orthoses uh, papers that have done the same thing. Why when that came out did everyone not say, oh my goodness, this is the future, we all do this from now. Why, are we, why 20 years on are we saying the future should really be doing this when Benno did it 20 years ago? Well, what, why is it not catching on? Well, there's, I've there's been lecturing about it for a long time and saying that, yeah. but yeah, it's... it's um... There's a paper you need to read, it's called Past, Present and Future of Podiatric Biomechanics. That was the same year. <laughs> <laughs> But, but you outlined you outlined beautifully in that paper, Craig. Oh. The reason the reasons people don't adapt to research findings, you know, and you listed them. You know, it comes down to vested interest of one form or another. Um, but you know, 20, 20 odd years we've we've been speaking on social media together, and you know, how frustrating is it that? The, the rate of change has been so slow, not just for orthosis research, in podi podiatry, in, in podiatric research in general. It's a slow old process. And, um, you know, uh, Craig, Craig and I have been, have been fighting that battle a long time. You're, you're relatively fresh face and you've really <laughs> taken that battle on. Hey, um, I'm, I'm, I'm 40 on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> I know I don't look it. I know I don't look it. I know. I don't. 
<laughs> you've had me some paper that, that's why. Like, <laughs> another really classic example, and I know Simon Barthard and, and I talk about this a, a number of times, you're looking at d do running shoes control motion? And you look at the studies that have looked at different design features and running shoes and over pronation in the rear foot. But, and the mean response might be X, but when you look at the data, you see people going in both directions. Yeah. So the mean response might be, well, no, it doesn't change motion, but in some people it cre increases, say, the E version, and others it increases the inversion. And it's that, it's what are the clinical predictors that predict that who might go in what direction and all those, all, you know, it's, it's, it's and again, I get frustrated because that's the first thing I do is, you know, go and look at, well, what's the spread of the data? Who went what way? Yeah. What went the other way? It, you know, it's... Um, well, one the of the best explanations me. of this was actually you, Ian. You, you, I, I was listening to a podcast by you the other day and you said if you had two, two subjects in a trial and you put a, an orthotic underneath their foot, the, 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 the one inverted by five degrees with the orthotic and the other subject everted by five degrees with the orthotic, the mean would be zero change. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, uh, uh, that was that's one of the best. Uh, uh, you know, I don't want to get big headed, but uh, that's that's one of the best examples of that that I've ever heard. Yeah, I mean, it's the problem with mean pooling data. That's, isn't that's the only compliment you're going to get for this year, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I'll take it. I'll take it. Um, so. So we pick up a research paper, we need to look at the experimental group, we need to look at the control group, we can't just read the abstract and decide whether we like or dislike the findings. We need to apply, we need to be, we need to apply clinical reasoning, we need to look into the, the, the design methodology. We can't just say, oh look, this orthosis works for X or doesn't work for Y. We need to say, we need to look at the conclusions, but, but they need to be coloured through the context of these kind of limitations that we're talking about. So, Let's, let's head on to where, where the future of orthosis research. So, I mean, if you could, we've probably already touched on it, but if you could design the, the perfect study, right? well, no, let me rephrase that, but no such thing as perfect research. Um, what, what, what would you like orthosis research to look like? How ideal can it get? I would like to see it be, uh, be a series of studies, starting with identifying the predictors of a pathology, I would like then to see foot orthoses designed to impact on the predictors which account for the greatest variance within that pathology. I would like then to see a sham device designed and demonstrated to have minimum to zero impact on those variables. Uh, at that stage, I would probably like to see a nice, well-designed, uh, sham-controlled trial. But what I wouldn't want to see is a sham-controlled trial. Mm. And that's, that's where we've got to. I, I don't know why. I guess because the, the controlled trial is seen as the gold standard, we've raced to the finish before we even got to the start. Yeah, but my, my approach to that would be, you, I think we know from, like, we, again, I, I keep talking about plant, plantar fasciitis. I think we know what, clinically, what design features we perhaps should use. You know, invert the rear foot, sorry, invert the forefoot, invert the rear foot, put a plantar fascial groove in if it's the plantar fascia's prominence. I think there's a rationale there for that. There is some some evidence for that. So I'd, I'd like to see, well, if you do these design features, yes, you do reduce the load in the plantar fascia so a lab-based experiment that yeah. shows that they but yeah, but, they, we need, we need, yeah. but we need to show that and and also you know we need i i hate the terms a bit that they are the terms you need a focus group of expert <laughs> clinicians yeah. to decide on what those design features are yeah but, um, but, but i think you you and i agree on it Craig, yeah. because you and I have been talking for 20 years on the subject. We could get Dennis Kuiper in, <laughs> and he, he may have a very different idea of what a foot or fascist, plantar fasciitis might look like. Now, we can't ignore that. You have to say, okay, uh, Dennis, thanks for your opinion, and, 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 and perhaps give a reasoned argument as to why 
our design might be better than another design, but you've still got to go through that phase of saying, okay, this is what they're doing in France. This is what they're doing in Germany. This is what Dennis Piper's mm. doing. This is what I'm doing. Uh, you've got to have that dialogue. Yeah, but to me, but the, that, the first part would be that lab-based study show. This is the design that reduces the yeah. load. Yeah. Then, which is what they're doing with the, the, the gate retraining stuff. The gate retraining yeah. stuff. What we what we've got is uh, we've got lab-based work, which which shows the potential impact on non-injured runners. So it seems theoretically plausible that if we make those changes in injured runners, it should have a similar impact on the the target tissue yeah but then once but once that lab work's been done now what i think and you you and i might think reduces the load the lab may show we're wrong so we've got to go back to the drawing board but then that's when you yeah. then do the yeah, clinical yeah. trials to say that this design versus this design which may be a sham maybe a prefab maybe a generic custom made does lead to different outcomes but what i think where we're at now we've got so we were to do, and I see. I call that a high high dose design, and then the generic shapes are low dose. But if you're going to do a clinical trial on um, foot, plantar fasciitis, foot orthoses versus homeopathy, and you use a sort of a low dose generic type custom made device or prefab, you're going to get a placebo response in both groups. There may actually be no difference between the two groups. Yeah. Whereas if you use that high dose design that has been shown to reduce the load in the tissue you know the response may be massive now it may not be but that's if, if it's not that's when we have to go back to the drawing board and look at our own clinical practice but i, I just don't see it heading well, down that we, pathway anytime we, soon. we also need to be mindful that that high dose in one individual might yeah. be a low dose in oh. another individual no but when i say high dose i mean the design features to reduce the load in the problematic tissue and of course that will vary from person to person <laughs> um, and, and the classic example there would be the addition of a plantar fascial groove um, yeah, but I, I, I think also that we need to take it that step further and show show that impact on the variable, which is why we were talking about Jack's test and, and dorsiflexion stiffness. You know, it, yeah, yes, those design features should be high dose, yeah. but let's see what, what they are actually doing in the subjects in the study. Oh, yeah. Simon, um, do you think it's fair to say that in our... In our sort of desire to standardise the groups in, in our studies, to standardise the experimental group, um, we've actually, that's been the huge hurdle in, in learning about these subject specific responses. And that's a fair comment. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, as you know, my, my PhD was in quantitative genetics. So the, the, the gold standard in quantitative genetics is to take identical twins who were separated at birth. Um, and, and look at differences between them because any differences between them in theory are due to differences in the environment and not due to genetic factors so what it, what i would like to see as 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 a phd in quantitative genetics is a group of uh, monozygotic twins um, half of whom uh, or, or both of whom have the same pathology and uh, they're randomized into treatment or control groups not going to be easy bad. <laughs> <laughs> but that would be a great one because you're eliminating a lot of the the, the, the genetic variables. You know, when we talk mm. about pathology and, and, and we talk about predictors, what we're basically doing is is partitioning the variance in, in a given pathology. Uh, now we, we could say okay so age is a factor fatigue is a factor xyz is a factor but equally we could partition the variance into genetic factors and environmental factors and and and, and the reason we get subject specific responses is because we've all got different genotypes and we've all been exposed to different environments by environments i mean non-genetic factors so you're always going to get individual responses. If we took MZ twins, at least the genotypes are pretty much the same. So you're eliminating some of that variation before you start. But it's never going to happen. No. Yeah. Can we can we talk about the neuromotor effect? Kevin's um, Kevin's just touched on it in a couple of comments, and obviously it's it's in my experience at least amongst clinicians, pretty poorly um, understood, oft, often ignored. Um, 
could you use could you summarize for people listening who may have never heard of the neuromotor effect in sort of simple terms what it is <laughs> okay so you've got uh photophosis can only really work uh in, in two ways they can either impact on the psychology and and, and, and and psychological factors in the in the patient or they can have a direct mechanical effect at the foot orthosis inter interface now in some cases that direct mechanical effect at the foot orthosis interface can lead to an indirect central nervous system mediated effect so the, the, the best example of this is when you have a foot orthosis which is designed to reduce the amount of pronation, let's say. And when the patient walks on that device, they pronate more. Now what we think is happening there is the direct mechanical effect of the device is trying to push the foot into inversion but the central nervous system is is detecting that if it blindly followed the, the mechanical push of the foot orthosis, it might result in injury to the body. Uh, in, in that case, with a, a, an inversion sprain, for example. So to protect the body, what the what the central nervous system does is activate the pronatory muscles, the peroneals to prevent an ankle inversion injury. So that would be a central nervous system mediated effect. Now you, you see this occasionally, uh, where you, you put somebody on a device and, and you, you're expecting them to, to look less inverted or the same, but actually they appear to be pronating more on, on the device. Um, doesn't happen all the time, but if you're using, if you're using inverted devices or you know, I use modified medial heel scars. Kevin's, Kevin's medial heel scars were, were all sort of 15 degrees based on different depths. I, I use a modified medial heel sky that was described by Ray Anthony. So I can do, I'll sometimes do heel scars at 20, 25 degrees. And in some of those cases, you get these, these CNS mediated effects. I've always described them to patients as if, I, if we see something that just feels a bit strange if it doesn't seem to follow the laws of mechanics uh, then it's probably the neuromotor effect the question then becomes yeah. how do we account for this in our research or how do we how do we how do we blend this this into research uh i don't know what, what does the boss say <laughs> what can you uh, can you scroll down to his question craig I've, I've um, my screens just just wait a minute he might be on <laughs> i've seen him a link i mean i, I think it's a difficult one uh, I mean, the obvious way to detect it would be with the EMG. Oops, you've just frozen up again, Simon. So you... you my, oh, he's back. Well, if you're putting a device clean... Yeah, yep, you're back now. What I was saying was, you know, probably the best way to detect it would be with EMG. So if you're putting a device in, let's say an inverted device with a medial heel scythe, what we wouldn't necessarily expect to see with that is an increase in the activity of the perineals. If you're seeing an increase in the activity of the perineals, that's probably a, 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 an indirect neuromotor effect, right? Mm. So yeah. I'm guessing the boss is going to say with EMG. Yeah, well, let's <laughs> just give it a moment and we'll see what he has to say. <laughs> <laughs> so oh hello here he is he's joining us yeah just oh top man we can see you there kevin but we can't see your picture or we can't hear you Red's coming. it was well, a pig truly, yeah this truly is a tree <laughs> do you know this, do you know ian do you know the story of it's a pig I do, but there'll be people that don't. So go on. You've told me before, but tell uh, tell, tell the listeners because oh. I know that you and Kevin have had this chat on Facebook in the past, and I'm sure well, it, it, people. It, it was it was it was probably the meeting where Kevin took me under his wing. Um, but the, I was there with with a, a podiatrist called Tony Achilles, and we were chatting during the coffee break, and Kevin had been out for his morning run. 
And he came back and he said, I saw this animal on my run. And I don't know what it's called. And we were sort of sick. Cause we, it, at the time, the, the, the Biomechanics Summer School was at this, this sort of old stately home in the middle of Oxfordshire. So we were saying, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah w w was it a deer? Was, was it a stag? Was it something like that? And he, he, he kept saying, oh, I don't know, I don't know. Anyway, half an hour later, Kevin was in the middle of a lecture. He was on stage giving this lecture. Uh, and Ke Tony and I were sat in the, the, the front row. I think I was even videoing him. And all of a sudden, in the middle of this lecture, he completely stopped what he was doing, turned around and said, it was a pig. <laughs> <laughs> so that's 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 where that comes from. Now Ke Kevin's here listening. He has, Kevin hasn't got a microphone in his office, so to, to respond, so oh, okay. thought we'd give it a try. So here, yeah. um, that would have been a treat. Yeah. So should we? Is it reasonable then to, to conclude we should be EMG? We should be, be utilising EMG in, in all of our first research. Is that is that a, a, an unfair extrapolation of what you oh, just said? Wow. No. Okay, let's open that that can of worms, shall we? Mm -hmm. um, I think EMG has got a big future in photosynthesis research. It's not without its problems. Um, you know, you've got. The, let, let's talk about that, that, those Telfer studies again. You know, one of the muscles they couldn't they couldn't uh, take any EMG readings from was to be able to do because they were using surface mounted uh, electrodes. So because because tip post is deep, they couldn't actually get signal from tip post. So if we're using surface mounted stuff, there's limitations. If we use fine needle, and uh, you were involved in some fine needle research here, I, I um, did. I was, yeah. yeah. Well, as in, I was, I was the subject. I was the subject. Well, the the problem with fine needles is they're only picking up the the signal from the the the, the muscle fibres immediately surrounding that needle. So you can have areas of the muscle that are active, but not that area around where the needle is. And you'd get a, a false negative flexor. Mm -hmm. So, EMG research is not without its problems either. Get get somebody who's an expert on EMG to come and talk to. Yeah, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. Actually. But but it comes back to what I'm 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 no expert. On it. But it comes comes back to what we we're talking about before is that we we need some simple clinical tests that will help us predict what a kinematic kinetics response might be. We need a simple clinical test to predict what an Absolutely. EMG response might be without actually doing the EMG. So the lab-based work on the EMG, you know, what does Jack's test do to, if you reduce Jack's test with an athletic design feature in this foot type, what does it do to the EMG? So we, we can sort of be, make a pretty good assumption in our clinical practice as to what that might be doing without actually having to do the EMG. But again, it's that. Yeah. Which is why, you, you know, the, we, we, what, what, what do we all have in common? Well, supination resistance. Yeah. You know, supination resistance is a great variable absolutely stunning variable uh and and you know if i was uh, if i was involved in some foot orthosis research right now that's exactly the variable i'd be looking at what's what's the impact of my foot orthoses on supination resistance uh chris mclean's just commented off the back of uh, our chris. emg uh, off the back of our emg chat that uh, mri is an option any thoughts on that <laughs> Uh, not an area that I, I, I'm an expert on at all, but uh, I know we're getting sort of fast MRI stuff coming through. Um, so you could, I, I guess we could, if we, can, if we could have dynamic MRI, but who's going to have access to that? Mm -hmm. I'm, yeah. I'm, like, I'm never going to own that equipment in my clinic. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and this is what we, we, we're saying. What what we need is 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 the is the clever boffins to do the research, and to do the research using foot orthoses that you and I might use, but ultimately we need low tech, low cost clinical tests. I can use in my clinic tomorrow morning, hmm. and, and and MRI ain't one of them. Not not here in the UK. Yeah, might be in yeah. Canada, Chris, but it ain't here. <laughs> Um, it really comes back to what we've been saying. We need better predictive models so we know what, what we should be measuring. We then well, we need, need... we need predictive models which have variables that are easily accessible by Johnny Average clinician. 
Mm. I mean, you can have you can have a predictive model, which includes knee abduction moment, but if if you and I can't measure that, that's not really that helpful, is it? Mm. Mm. No, but it comes back to what I said earlier on about the study being done by Richard Jones and at Salford, where they're only including those are. They are looking at what can be done clinically to predict those responses. You know, but it's it's interesting. This is all happening in lateral wedging for NeoA. It's not happening in foot orthotic research in general. And I, I just think what they're doing there, and after the discussion I had with him, it's quite exciting. But let's take all that stuff and apply it to the foot orthosis in general. Um, why, why do you think it's not happening in, in, in foot orthosis research? I, look, I, I, I don't know. I think there is perhaps a, it's that is disconnect that between clinical funding? practice and research. Uh, is I, there I think, a funding gap? Sorry? I missed that. Is bit. there a funding gap there? Oh, I, I, of course, but I just think that the, whether it's clinical trial design methodology where you do, you know, use a heterogeneous population, you use the same drug dose on all the participants, you use the same orthoses on all the participants, whether it's a hangover from that. I, I am concerned about those, and I, I was probably a bit harsh in that blog post when I talked about people with a superficial understanding of foot orthoses who are doing the systematic reviews and meta-analyses and not, not understanding the, the differences in the design features. Um, I think there's, there's quite an element of that. Um, do you, know what I, do you know what I think needs to be done, all right? And, 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 and we, we almost did it. You know, on the alpidiatry arena, you, you, you started something called like the foot orthosis genesis project. Oh, yeah, and gave like up that. after a few weeks. Yeah. <laughs> but that needs to be done. You know, um, the, the, there was a really nice uh, paper by your mate Ian, um Brad Neal and, and, and the guys where they they had an expert panel talk about gait retraining and that that paper is for, applied to foot orthosis is crying out to be written mm -hmm. you need an expert panel from around the world and say okay um, where where are we in terms of the design features, the, 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 the dose features that you or I would put in to a patient with tibialis posterior dysfunction. But I, I think the three of us would probably agree on what those are. And that was the problem with, I had with the idea I had that you know, go down this pathway, yeah. But there were very, very vocal individuals quite viciously and vigorously and vocally in disagreement. Yeah, but I, I so think question, you, I think the question we, becomes: How do you pick your panel? Well, I I, you, I could bias a panel by picking it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but no, but to me, how you would do it, you'd perhaps do an internet survey and you say, um, please name the twenty people who you would look up to the most when it comes to orthotic prescribing. There you you know, and then you end up with your twenty or whatever people. Well, that'd be the so your your, your experts are picked by the the community. Um, That's and a good idea. The, these people who I think are very vocal and I think you might be wrong and, and not going to get voted on, but then they might run a social media campaign to get voted on. So, you know, like, we talk about the systematic reviews um, mm. being, you know, the level one evidence that the best evidence we currently have, but you only, yeah, as, as, as it's been said before, you only get out of a systematic review what you put in. So when there's been systematic reviews on foot orthoses, if all the studies that are put into it have these limitations that we've discussed, these design uh, flaws that we've discussed, then yes, it's level one evidence, but, but how much can we really look at the, the conclusions of the systematic reviews and hang our hat on those? Uh, it feels like we can't. Well, the third party funders look at the systematic reviews and base their funding models on it, and that's the problem. It's that superficial understanding who don't understand orthotic doses and as I said in that blog post, almost all of those studies I'd, I'd exclude, so. Yeah. yeah. So conclusion, Simon, we're just looking at the time, it's nine o'clock, probably means we've been on about an hour. I could go on forever, I know, you know we, we, have, we, we do talk about this all the time, I know on the phone. Um, dosing, you know, uh, we've, talk, we've touched on it, we've touched on how we can dose devices uh, if we were doing research. 
if we're in clinic tomorrow morning, um, is there any, any, any way we can apply this yet? Are we, again, if by doing so, are we trying to run before we walk? Is it, do, do we need that, that formative lab-based work before we can do anything clinically, or is there any clinical gems you can give people who prescribe orthoses tomorrow in clinic? Well, we, we, we've already said it, haven't we? If I'm prescribing a device for somebody with plantar, plantar fasciitis, I'm going to get them. I'm going to, I'm going to do a Jack's test, and I'm either going to quantify it or qualify the, the dorsiflexion resistance of that hallux. Uh, and then I'm going to get them standing on the device, and I'm going to repeat that test. And if, if I perceive that that dorsiflexion stiffness hasn't reduced with that device in situ, I'm going to make changes to that device, either in terms of the, the rear foot. Uh, various posting or the four foot valgus posting or the addition of a plantar fascial groove or Morton's uh, reverse Morton's or a kinetic wedge whatever floats your boat but that's we you know I think we do a disservice to a lot of clinicians a lot of clinicians they're already doing this stuff. Oh, exactly it's not, it, it's not new they're doing it uh, and, and I guess this is this is where we get back to is you, you know, as clinicians, we're already doing it. Why aren't the researchers asking that, us what That was going to be my exact point to summarise it. Orthotic dosing is what we do clinically. It's yeah. not what's done in the clinical trials, and that's that yeah. disconnect. And that's the, the lip service gets paid to orthotic translation. Well, you can't translate orthotic research unless it reflects clinical practice. And orthotic dosing is what we do day in and day out. And I, I yeah. it's... Um, you know, I'm, I'm pleased it's finally, say, bubbling above the surface, that whole co the whole concept, you know. It's... So right. I think we've any been... Other, any other questions that have come in, Craig? No, Extreme nothing. Yeah, lots right. of comments. It, it's sort of, um, yeah, I just, just lots of comments. I, think, I don't think you find many clinicians disagreeing with the concept. <laughs> so, look, anyway, I think, I think we'll wind up. Look, thanks so much, Simon. The hour has, as per normal, has gone really, Cheers, really quickly. Guys. Um, for those who've joined late, this will be on Facebook in about 10 minutes. It will be on YouTube in a couple of hours. Um, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, like our Facebook page. We have an email address on our website where we will send notifications to when these are done. So, again, thanks um, so much, Simon. Um, thanks, mate. Can I, can I just say, can I just say, didn't swear once, Griffiths? <laughs> no, you didn't. <laughs>